Hello and welcome to another episode of the e-commerce coffee break podcast. Today we want to find out why first party data is the new must have for DTC marketers and what that has to do with conversion rates, remarketing, segmentation and email marketing. Mm -hmm. Joining me on the show today is Larry Kim. Kim is uh, he's the CEO of Customers.ai, a website visitor identification and customer journey platform. Customers AI was ranked the fastest growing go-to-market product in 2023, 2023 by Iconic Capital and G2. Previously, Larry founded Wordstream, a PPC marketing company acquired by USA Today in 2018. So let's welcome him to the show. Hi, Larry. How are you today? Doing great. Thanks, Klaus. Thanks for having me. Larry, we're talking about first party data, maybe for our listeners who do not really know the differences between first party, second party, third party, give me an overview of what it actually means. Um, sure. Uh, first party data is the data that you yourself are collecting. Uh, it's, it's really your business's competitive advantage in terms of like, you know, your customer list, your prospects, uh, people filling out forms, people visiting your website, um, you know, those interactions. Uh, third party data, uh, this is data that you're paying for through third parties. Um, you know, for example, uh, marketers have been very uh, fortunate over the last decade to be able to just punch in a couple uh, demographics like, you know, uh, single or married or like where you just in Facebook ads, you can just punch in a couple uh, targeting features. And, uh, you know, through the, through the magic of third party data, you're able to then, uh, you know, pay for a service that is giving you direct access to uh the the target market that you care about and so um the, the issue of course with third-party data is that it is becoming more scarce uh that um the mechanism of uh companies like google and facebook to to collect that information that third-party data was had a lot to do with um using third-party data pixels uh, which were kind of tracking your clicks and your movements through through the through the internet. Uh, the way that worked was because if you visited a website that had a Google or Facebook uh, pix pixel installed uh, using the power of third party data, a third party pixel, they could figure out. Um, uh, oh, this is Klaus because he's logged into Gmail, or this is Larry because he's logged into into, into Facebook, um, you know, uh, on a, on a different um, you know tab or something like this. Uh, uh, so that was how they were kind of doing all this matching, and then they could figure out where, where all the sites that you visited, um, you know, for forever. Uh, and and you know that's been eliminated on um, on Chrome, sorry, on uh, Firefox and iOS and. And even Chrome a little bit, but they're 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 taking their, their time there. So um, you know the, that's the the punchline is that uh, the there was a really great run for for third party data for for about ten years, uh, but the 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 it's kind of uh, the golden days are in the rear rear, rear view mirror. Um, cool. Okay. Yeah. No. Obviously, Apple and Google they're going back and forth. Apple started, I think, first with taking things away. Google is a bit of going back and forth with it, but sooner or later will come. Now, obviously, DTC brands, online merchants are not in this comfortable position anymore that someone else is collecting the data. What can DTC brands actually do to effectively collect and organize first, data, first party data on, on their side now? Well, uh, the, the biggest thing that these brands, e-commerce DTC brands can do right now to uh, kind of mitigate some of these changes uh, is to do more with the first party data that they're already collecting. Uh, and, and so specifically, um, you know, one of the most valuable sources of data, data, first party data for a e-commerce or DTC brand is your website traffic. Like think about all the work that goes into your Pinterest campaigns or your, you know, your email marketing campaigns or like all the marketing and radio or television, like, the work that goes to putting people into those websites, um, in, in, into your website, that's, that's your first party data. Uh, and, uh, it, it belongs to you. Uh, and, and the, the issue here is that their brands are not fully taking advantage of the first party data enrichment options that, that are available in the market today. Uh, so probably by default, if you're using something like Google analytics, uh, it's enriching your website traffic to include some data fields like city, state, country, uh, and, and maybe maybe they might even give you like gender or something like this, but it's, it's very, very lim limited. Um, and 
there are products such as customers.ai. We're not the only company in the space, but because we're, we're talking here like customers.ai, uh, we can um, uh, take that first party valuable first party website traffic and, and fully enrich it uh, to, to uh, include additional uh, enrichment data, including identity, like your first and last name, your email address, your phone numbers, and, and, um, and this is this isn't a append. We're not giving you um, we're not giving you data of people who are shopping for things at other people's site. Okay, like this is it's it's your data. You're just getting a deeper understanding of of the of the people who are are already in market and who are in your funnels. Um, and uh, by doing it this way, you're kind of recovering some, a significant part of the use cases that are actually going to be lost through the deprecation of, of first party pixels, because once you have this data, then you don't have to lease it from the from the um, ad, ad companies, right? Because because you have an audience to, to market to uh, and, and, and you and you know who these people are. Uh, and and uh, it's just it's kind of like a rent versus owning like you, you, your question was like, what, what should they be doing? You need to think about owning your own data and then deploying that data strategically uh, in, in various different marketing use cases. Mm -hmm. I guess this famous saying, don't build your house on someone else's land. I think that's what a lot of people did in the past by relying too much on Meta, Facebook and putting all the data there. Now, you mentioned AI, you meant, mentioned data enrichment. Um, talk me through that. How does that go hand in hand? How does somebody who has no idea about it um, get an idea on how it works? Um, so there's, when it comes to AI and this motion of what we're talking about of, of, of enriching data, there's kind of two components uh, where AI is involved. Uh, firstly, it helps power the identification itself, um, that there's a lot of data sources like, you know, log files and uh, from, from ISPs and from like various sources. And it's very hard to make sense of, of everything. And um, there's kind of these looser, you know, algorithms that, that can be used to kind of connect the dots a, a little bit better, um, which, uh, you know, have emerged more recently. Uh, but the other side of the coin for AI as it pertains to this, this type of uh, channel has to do with making use of data. So if you think about, um, if you think about uh, marketing campaigns and you're, you know, typically they'll segment it into like two or three different subgroups because there's like, maybe it's for moms and for, for dads and for kids or something like this, a couple different segmentations. Um, the reason is because it's, it's a lot of work. It means like every time you run a campaign, you, you're going to need to, um, you know, triplicate the work to, because right. it, it gets sent out into, into different, um, you know, campaigns. Uh, and, and with generative AI, that's dramatically changing the story because like, every postcard that you send could have like different text on it or you know every something like every email that you send could be customized and so it's really unlocking the the value of of, of having you know more first party data because it it that last mile of acting on the data can be automated away Mm -hmm. makes perfect sense i think laser focused targeting personalization is, is a very important point today in e-commerce now a lot of merchants brands out there might raise the flag and say yeah but there is privacy regulations there's gdpr ccpa and so whatsoever now i'm dealing with all this data on my side are there any risks involved or how should they deal with these kinds of concerns sure klaus if you go to like lemonde.fr which is like the French newspaper, you know, w w website in the heart of GDPR, you know, uh, you know, country, uh, you know, it, 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 a pop up shows up and it says, hey, we're like, it, we, we're using, uh, you know, marketing trackers, <laughs> cookies, um, you know, uh, de device identifiers, like it, 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 it says everything that, that they're doing and, and you have to click the button that says accept. Uh, and so my point is just to say, um, you know, the antidote for a lot of these uh, regulations, actually all of them, has to do with sufficient dis disclosure. And I'm not advocating that you not 
disclose what you're doing with data. Uh, in the case of the Google and Facebook ad pixels, what was so untenable and so devious of Google and Facebook was that when you put the F Facebook ad pixel on your on your website and say you were you were selling like snowboards, that data that that Klaus or Larry visited that snow snowboard company was not only being used to to run your campaigns, but it was being used to power all the other snowboard vendors looking to connect with people. You know, and there's 10 million Google advertisers and 10 million Facebook advertisers, and that was not clearly disclosed. Okay, and so I think the marketers need to understand, like, you know, there's a way to do this that's compliant, like where you're not reselling the data to a network of 10 million people, where you're you're focused on your, you know, just enriching and using the first party data. I think consumers, generally speaking, would prefer to get marketing from companies that they know and like and trust rather than that than getting marketing from from co companies that they've never heard of before uh, and and so like i'm absolutely 100 percent for uh you know privacy and and compliance um but like what we're talking about here is at a much like reduced scope by focusing on solely on the use of first party data and then making the requisite disclosures like in your terms of service you, you can even call it out on a pop-up window that sometimes shows up on various sites uh and, and we provide templates on, on on what you should be using uh, like like what, what type of language that you should be using uh, uh but you know major corporations that have lots of lawyers you know have reviewed like our kind of approach and they've you know all, all agree that this is this is legal they're like you know it, it's, it's it's as long as it's disclosed yeah it makes absolutely sense i think transparency is the key there and as you said it's for the good of the customer you want to be personalized addressed by the brand you like and get information for the products that you're interested in and that's one way to do that now do you have some case studies, some uh, examples of companies and you worked with a lot of companies um, where you can see the, the massive difference by using first um, party data in their business now? We work with approximately a thousand uh, brands, uh, you know, with meaningful concentration in, in, in um, like North America, though. Um, and, uh, you know, we have brands that are doing uh, seven figures of incremental revenue uh, on a monthly basis uh, for uh, one of our use cases, which is email marketing. So you wouldn't want to email everybody who visits your website, okay? Because like they could have just visited a blog post or something like this, and you know they might just receive an email and they'll, they'll be like, I don't, I don't know why I'm getting this. But like with with software like our first party data and stuff like. We're not only IDing the the individual who's coming, but we're also scoring the the intent signals. Like, how much mm -hmm. this did they scroll? Like, what did they click on? How many pages did they visit? Or is it a repeat journey? Like, is, did, did they come back from somewhere? Um, you, you, know, you, see, you see what I'm saying? So, like, you can you can create very valuable user segmentations of people who have exhibited certain certain behaviors like on on your website in a first party context so that's key it's first this is your you're allowed to do this if it's your website okay uh yeah you can then route certain segmentations that are like ripe for conversion into mm -hmm. email automations which have extremely high conversion rates right like these, these are this is really the lowest hanging fruit here in in terms of like uh like if you had a, a dollar to spend on email marketing like these are the people that you should you should be e emailing it to it's just it's just, it's just that people don't know who those people are uh because they, they don't have like a first party you know website id data enrichment capabilities uh and and so this is an like when done correctly and the, and the wrong way to do this is to pixel your entire website and and, and email everybody like that's that's stupid um you know, like if, if, if done correctly, you can, you know, have your cake and eat it too. You're, you're going to generate all these conversions. Uh, it, it even increases your deliverability scores because like you're not delivering it to everyone. You're, you're getting high engagement because you're, you're targeting people who are very excited. Um, so 
but that's that's one example. I'll just provide one other example, um, which is we have uh, brands who have doubled the effectiveness of their meta advertising campaigns. Ads are garbage in, garbage out. Like if, if you have a strong signal going back to Facebook, describing like, you know, this was a good click and this was a bad one, um, then, then your ads will be great. If that connection is broken, and it is broken right now because of the sig signal de degradation, like, like, you know, like iOS and Fire Firefox, like they're, they're just deleting the, 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 the signal. Um, we can ID those people in a first party context and then securely encrypt and send that data back to Meta to augment the lost signals from your from your ad pixel. So that, that's why I believe like that's why Facebook ad performance is in the toilet for the last like three, four years. It's just because they have a lot of signal that they were using to 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 optimize these campaigns uh, that we were relying on uh, that that has kind of just evaporated. Uh, and you know we're, we're seeing dramatic results by just turning back on that that signal flow, but through a more compliant first party way. Um, you know uh, that, that that you can uh, you can both have double like this is one one example I'm thinking of the, the company doubled the number of conversions while simultaneously increasing ROAS, uh, which is which is I've never seen this before, uh, because normally when you increase quantity your 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 ROAS tanks, uh, but but this was this was like a rare phenomenon where you like if the the lost signal returns, every single starts working like it, it used to work like in 2018, 2019. So mm -hmm. no, I, I see the advantage that with your good data, with your clean data and rich data, you're helping Meta or Google um, by providing them a way to reach the right customers in their pools so it makes it much much easier so like, for them we, we we increase the match rate so like people who visit your site like you don't know what their facebook login is like maybe it's their their secondary email maybe it's a, they, maybe they signed up for facebook like 10 years ago or something and so like they, they have like an old email and now that's their junk email like we enrich um to to secondary ids like cell phone uh secondary emails and and we, we get matches that that, uh, that are, uh, you know, you're, we're casting a, a wider net here and, and being able to, uh, you know, significantly higher chance of, of, of uh, IDing the individual rather than um, relying on a Facebook pixel that has a broken connection back to Facebook because of all the blocking that's going on. Mm -hmm. Larry, most of our listeners are DTC brands, are Shopify store owners. Give me an idea on how they can integrate that into their workflow, into their day-to-day -day life. Uh, typically, you just pick one use case, like either you're spending a lot of money on ads and you just want to like make it work, you know, 30, 40% better, or they have a, like a, like a Clavio, or, you know, email marketing revenue, and they want to generate more incremental flow revenue, like so, so more email coming from automations. Uh, and and you, just, you just pick one, you install the pixel, we carve out the different segmentations, like people who are on your website for more than three minutes, or people who click on, you know, the, the buy page, but or the product listing page, but didn't make it to the shopping cart. So, so you, 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 you create the segmentations, and then you just direct the different segmentations to different actions like sending an email or sending to to a, a Facebook meta audience for for remarketing purposes it, it's it's pretty simple um, one of the neat approaches the benefits of this approach is that there's quite a lot of different actions that we can we can power it doesn't have to be just emailing or Facebook ads uh, you know uh, one one would be sending a postcard like postcards are actually the new ads really? by the way like <laughs> it's kind of like all this ad revenue decades ago was kind of eliminating postcard marketing, <laughs> but now, now there's so much in ads that, that people are doing postcards. Like we, we can enrich to include you know, mailing address. And so like we can zap that data to a, a postcard provider along with other attributes, you know, using AI, they can write something customized based on what their knowledge is. Cause we, we, we can provide other attributes. Like, are they married? Do they have children? Uh, you know, are they a pet owner? Like you can engineer interesting prompts to to have a very customized responses. You know, there, there's a lot of different actions that we can power with this data, which is what I was talking to about earlier, uh, that AI is unlocking the value of first-party data by making it easier to act on it. 
Mm -hmm. As we're in a podcast, obviously, we can't share any kind of screenshots or admin tools. Walk me through what I would see in my day-to-day -day life when I create a campaign. Uh, how does that look like? What are the steps involved? Um, step one is getting the pixel installed. So this is a standard pixel installer and it, you know, it, there's integrations with like Shopify or, or, um, WordPress or Google tag manager. Uh, you just click a couple buttons and it'll, it'll integrate itself. And there's a way to test to see if that's receiving data. Once you're receiving data, you, you'll be able to start seeing a, like a table with a flood of like, oh, here's Klaus, here's Larry. It, it's actually pretty funny. You'll, you'll start seeing people that you recognize like, oh, this, <laughs> the, this, this is the, the mother of one of my, my kid's friends or like, you know, the, the, all sorts of people are checking you out and you'll, you'll, you'll recognize some of them. Um, and, and, um, you know, then what you do is you start just l looking at this torrent of emails coming through and, and start identifying like, what are the common signals? Like, okay, well, just show me the ones who visit the pricing page or just show me the ones who, who, who visited, uh, you know, for, for more than three page views or more than two minutes, like, and you'll be able to just like run a query and it'll, it'll, it'll show you the data. Uh, and once you kind of figure out a segmentation that you think makes sense, you, you then you just group and organize that into a segmentation and, and, and assign it to an action. So. Okay. It becomes very clear to me now why you're called customers.ai, because it's customers and AI working hand in hand there. So that's perfect. I, I like the idea of receiving a postcard. I hope they will not start sending faxes because I don't no one has a fax <laughs> machine anymore. <laughs> well, actually, one of my customers is is Documo, which is, is like one of the biggest fax fax machine uh, electronic fax companies. But but yes, it, it is an old technology. You're right. Yeah. Okay. Is there any kind of homework a merchant or brand needs to do before they can get started? Um, you know, I, this is really so um, like horizontal, like, like my thinking is like whatever marketing a DTC brand is doing, all roads eventually lead back to the website. You know, like if you're doing Instagram ads or if you're doing Pinterest, you know, organic stuff, like they generally, find their way back and so like it just strikes me as like you know they should have a way to uh to record that information it would be like um you know like a lot the 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 issue here is is is, is one of urgency okay uh like like I, like i don't know like sometimes we have people saying things like oh we've got a big mother's day sale Let, let's think of this like turning this on afterwards but I, then i'm like no 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 <laughs> like what you have to think about is is like you have to turn on the 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 recording device before <laughs> before the sale uh so that you can kind of you know follow through on on the ones that that didn't do the the actions that you're hoping for uh, and so so this is like a mindset of like um you know proactivity uh, ra ra rather than a you know reactive mentality and that's that's sort of the key. Mm -hmm. Makes perfectly sense. Now, what's what's your price structure? How does that work? Um, so again, we have different modalities. Uh, one is like a email use case, and one is a ad use case. Or you could you could do both. Um, uh, typically, ID every contact that we ID that it's um, it's it's somewhere around twenty cents to 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 show show you that information and that cost then declines over time like if if uh uh if it's like over a thousand or something you know it'll it'll go down to 18 cents or 17 cents like it, it just it just goes down over time and in fact we even have like a unlimited uh, plan where you can you know if you have a really big website and you have so much data we'll we'll just you know provide it to you at a fixed price so that it, so, it, so it doesn't go up or down but my point is just to say that you know even if it's like 10 15 20 cents a, a, a lead um that's a small fraction of what you're paying for the click like a facebook click could be like four or five dollars and just for an incremental 17 cents or something to, to know who that was and to be able to remark it to them and email them it's 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 actually the the, the most economical um uh go to market like that exists currently like it, it, as far as my 
my opinion as a as a marketer um the ad use case is um uses uh it's more of a contact management fee um typically the people doing ads they're, they're not as interested in the phone numbers and the emails of, of people they they just want to run campaigns mm -hmm. uh that that are working uh and so the pricing is based on like a cpm based off of off of uh like say, say we have a hundred thousand contacts and we send that to, to to facebook um it would be like a seven or eight dollar cpm so it's less than a penny per contact um mm -hmm. so uh you know we think this is this is uh very valuable and and affordably priced um it's true that this is uh like in comparison to like meta from like four or five years ago like you didn't need to pay a, a few pennies to to run remarketing ads but they were using that data in all sorts of you know pretty crazy ways uh so it, it's kind of renting versus owning there's a small amount to to you know capture and own this data and manage it yourself but the benefit is now that's your data and, and, and you can use this to identify repeat visitors or you know power welcome back sequences or all sorts of other uh, other things whereas you know meta and google were kind of clandestinely power taking that data not they were kind of keeping you in the dark they would never show you it but they would track it for you <laughs> Uh, and if you wanted to use it, you'd have to pay. Um, and they were sharing it with like, you know, 10, 10 million other advertisers. So like, I think this is a great deal, Klaus. Like, what, what, what do you think? I think so too. I think um, you mentioned before the golden times were, I don't know, seven, eight, nine years ago when everything was easy and the data was available for everyone, as you said, and not only for yours. And now things needed to get worse. And I think a lot of advertisers out there, marketing managers had a couple of rough years behind them now until now tools like yours are coming out that are basically are better than what there was before and helping them to get better results than before because as you said it's owned marketing you still get get back to the quality that you might have or the volume that you might have had in the past and for a price that you can afford because obviously everything got more expensive uh, but now you can do it more affordable it was it was an incredible time Klaus like Facebook and Google were killing each other to try to provide like the best data for for like the least amount of like overhead like they were just trying to make this accessible like you could open an account and three minutes later have access to like you know 10,000 different audiences like for demographics behaviors and and, and um, uh, 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 interests uh, so, so, so like like that's that was a, that was really unprecedented in, in the in human history uh now it's it's kind of the amount of, of of data and analytics is i think what's happening is now that they're trillion dollar businesses like they're not and they've gotten in trouble with privacy and all this stuff like there's not a lot of upside to sticking their neck out there by you know creating even more innovative targeting or you know something like they're saying this is good enough don't let's let's just like google and facebook has kind of agreed to like you know, go, go easy, I think, is, 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 is kind of my, my understanding here. Okay. No, I think as a brand, it's, it's more important than anything else that you own the data and then make the best out of it. Before our coffee break comes to an end today, Larry, is there anything that you want to share with our listeners that we haven't covered yet? Um, I just think this is a very exciting time. Um, as a marketer, you have to be able to tell the future. Okay, the most successful marketers are the ones who kind of know what's going to happen. Uh, and uh, the best way to tell the future is to look look at the past. Uh, and if you think about like pre Google and Facebook ads, the companies that were doing the best were the companies that had the most data, like like big brands like Walmart, like they had so much information on hand. They, they were giants. Uh, you know, over the last decade or so, that barrier to entry has come down significantly because of the introduction of, of things like you know third-party data and, and making that so accessible and available uh that is in the rear view mirror and the the, the barriers are, are going back up the companies that are th going to thrive in the next you know three four five ten years are the ones that have first party their own first party data that they can leverage to to execute on intelligent marketing campaigns and now is the time to to you know 
be investing in and thinking about these strategies. Um, what do you think? I absolutely agree with you 100%. And I think um, everyone who is building a brand or who has a brand out there and wants to go into the future, they have to own the data and they need to know what to do with the data. Where can people find out more about you guys? Uh, I'm at uh, customers.ai. Uh, there's a free offer for evaluating both the, the email marketing piece as well as the uh, ad retargeting uh, uh, functionality for, for uh, seven days and 500 uh, free contacts enrichments. Uh, you know, 500 leads, like just, it's gonna be awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and, and uh, you give that a try uh, for free. Absolutely. I will put the links in the show notes and you're just one click away. And um, to our listeners, try it out. That sounds like a really good deal to enrich your, your data there. Larry, thanks so much for your time today. I think that was a very good over, um, overview of what first party data means and what you need to do as a merchant to stay successful. Thanks so much for your time today. Thank, thank you, Klaus. Hey, Klaus here. Thank you for tuning in to another episode. Before we wrap things up, I've got a couple of important points to share. Firstly, if you have enjoyed today's episode and want to support the show, here's a simple way to do it. Help me out with that algorithm magic by liking, commenting, and subscribing on your favorite podcast app. And if you're feeling extra generous, leaving a rating would be great. Your support helps me bringing more impactful guests on the show, and it makes it easier for others to discover the podcast. Secondly, I want to talk about to all your business owners out there. Here's a question. Are you tired of juggling everything in your business while struggling with your marketing tasks? Fed up with hit and miss experiences of hiring freelancers or agencies that don't quite get your vision? But perhaps you're not ready to commit to a full-time in-house marketer just yet. Well, I've got a solution for you. Introducing our fractional marketing team. My team and I provide top-notch experienced marketing professionals to become an extension of your business. Not only will they save you up to 50% on cost compared to traditional hires, but they also take care of all this time-consuming, repetitive and complex marketing tasks that have been holding you back. And this way, you can concentrate on what truly matters, the core of your business. To learn more about how we can help you to scale up your online sales with a fractional team member, head over to our website, smart-ecommerce-marketing.com, or reach out to me directly and I'll get you the details. You will find the links in the show notes. Thanks for being a part of our podcast community and remember your support means the world to me. Until next time, see you then.